you have Bibles, congratulations on that, I guess. Uh, please turn with me to the book of Nahum in the Old Testament. The Old Testament prophet of Nahum, chapter 3. Nahum, chapter 3. What we are doing at this time is we are continuing a series we started five, six weeks back in the book of Nahum. And uh, the series is called, When God Goes to War. We often think of God in terms of being God is love, God is gracious, God is kind, God is patient, God is good. And of course, we affirm all of those things because the Bible tells us all of those things about God, but the Bible also tells us some other things. And as we began in the book of Nahum about five or six weeks ago, what we found out was that apart from, of course, being a gracious God and a kind God and a patient God, God is also, and this is from His own mouth, God is a jealous and avenging God. God is a jealous and avenging God. And what we find in the book of Nahum is a prophecy, is a message that is given, that's directed at a city that if you know your Old Testament all right, you know the name of this city, you've encountered it before, and the name of the city is Nineveh. And you know that, of course, if you've ever read the book of Jonah. And the city of Nineveh in the book of Jonah was targeted by God, essentially, for a message of repentance. And God sent Jonah, who went against his will, and ended up there by very interesting circumstances, and preached repentance, preached that the city of Nineveh should repent, should turn from its wickedness and oppressive evil ways, and Nineveh did. And then what happened is, somewhere along the line, over the course of about a hundred years, Nineveh fell back into its oppressive, evil, wicked patterns, and began being this real trouble spot. And Nineveh is the capital of a major empire in the ancient Near East called Assyria. And so whenever we read about Nineveh in the, book of, uh, in the Bible, it's, it's, it is a, the city, Nineveh, but it also stands representatively for this powerful nation called Assyria. And what happened is that, like I said, a hundred years after that, Nineveh is the target of God again. So for this time, there is no message of repentance offered. This time, God has had enough. This time, God is prepared to go to war against the nation of Assyria, the city of Nineveh. And he sends a man named Nahum to preach this message. Now, what we also discovered was that Nahum did not go to Nineveh to preach this message. He actually probably stayed right where he was in the nation of Israel, God's chosen elect people, Israel, in the Old Testament. And he preached to them. And the, the message of the book of Nahum is not for a warning for Nineveh, but it is a message of comfort for God's people. Because they were oppressed. They were crushed and ground down by Assyria. And God said, but it won't continue that way. Don't worry, I'm going to do something about your oppressors. And this is what it will look like. And there are several historical hints throughout the book of Nahum that point to what God actually then later did to bring down the city and then bring down the empire. And we looked at some of those. And if you're interested in uh, kind of catching up on the series, if you haven't been around, we do have all of our sermons up on YouTube and you can go back and review that and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but today we're going to talk, uh, this is part five for us. We're going to talk a little bit about shame. We're going to talk a little bit about shame in the book of Nahum. So if you have your Bibles, Nahum chapter three is where we are going to be. And if you're following along in your sermon notes, you can pull those out at this time. And uh, your very first fill in on your sermon notes is this right here. When God's judgment comes, it is severe. When God's judgment comes, it is severe. Um, God doesn't kid around. He doesn't just sort of 
well, I'll get to that later. And he doesn't just sort of, I'll, I'll poke at him a little bit and see then maybe if they will turn and repent. No, when God decides something's time has come to an end, He ends it. He completes the process with judgment. And as we will see kind of throughout the book of Nineveh, as we kind of reach towards the conclusion, which we'll hope, probably reach that about next week, what we'll find is that God is very thorough. God doesn't leave any stone unblasted when He comes in judgment. And He raises up an army called Babylon to take care of Assyria, which then becomes the next sort of big empire on the scene, and then God does stuff later with them. If you've read your Old Testament, you might know some of that story. But let's focus on Nahum chapter 3. Nahum chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And I'm reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible. It's a really good little translation. Uh, Nahum chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Woe to the city of blood, totally deceitful, full of plunder, never without prey. The crack of the whip and the rumble of the wheel, galloping horse and jolting chariot, charging horseman, flashing sword, shining spear, heaps of slain, mounds of corpses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over their dead. Now, if you came to church today looking for an inspirational moment... You may be just a little bit disappointed this morning because this is what we are dealing with. Not everything is an inspirational moment. Some moments are, this is going to hurt. And this is exactly what we find in the book of Nahum when God begins the process of judgment against the city of Nineveh and Assyria. Uh, we begin with this one little three-letter word at the beginning of this, woe. Woe. The word woe, whenever you read it in the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter, is a statement of judgment. It's a statement of judgment, and it is as severe as it gets. This is as bad as it gets. So when you see, for example, in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 23, Jesus pronouncing woes against the scribes and Pharisees, woe against the scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, uh, on the outside, you are whitewashed tombs, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones, and there's all kinds of stuff that Jesus says. Any kind of pronouncement of woe is meant to stop you in your tracks because you know that whatever is coming next is serious business. It's very serious business because God is not trifling here. God is stepping into the picture, and He has... He's fully armed and ready to do as much damage as he sees fit. And he says, woe, judgment. To who? To the city of blood. Speaking about Nineveh here. He calls it the city of blood. He calls it totally deceitful, full of plunder, never without prey. And what he is saying about the city of Nineveh is, this is one of, one of the several causes for God to come and do his judgment. There are there are a number of charges throughout chapter 3, and we'll hit at least, I think, two of them today. The first charge is that this is a violent city. This is a city that is nothing but interested in ruin. It's nothing but interested in... And it's not just the city of blood, it's not just the city of violence, but interestingly, it's totally deceitful that how the city of Nineveh, how the nation of Assyria goes about its violent, evil, wicked, oppressive business is through the process of deception. So that what you find throughout Assyria's history is that it makes all sorts of treaties with lesser nations to use as it sees fit. And when it's done with those cities, if, it's, if those cities aren't living up to Nineveh's standards and giving enough tribute and doing all that, then it breaks those treaties, turns on them, and decimates them. And that's actually what the city of Nineveh, the, the nation of Assyria, has been doing in regards to Israel. 
some of the Israelite kings of the northern kingdom. The kingdom was divided into two kingdoms that were sort of factions fighting against each other. And the northern kingdom said, well, we'll make treaties with all these places so that they can protect us. And one of them was Assyria. And the Assyrian king decided he didn't like them anymore and jumped all over them and betrayed them and deceived them and destroyed them. And so by the time you get to the end of this particular period in history, Israel has been reduced to one tiny insignificant kingdom, and Assyria has played a major role in reducing God's people to this tiny insignificant remnant, and God's not done even with them at that point. But they have betrayed, they have deceived, they are full of plunder, they're never without prey. They're always looking for somebody to take advantage of. It's part of the charge here. They're violent, deceptive, and they're always on the lookout for more for themselves. And then we have this description of what the city of Nineveh can expect to hear in its own streets. Crack of the whip, the rumble of the wheel, the galloping horse, the jolting chariot. This is war coming into the city of blood, the city of violence, the city of evil, the city of oppression. What they have done to everyone else, God will now revisit back upon them. Charging horsemen, flashing swords, shining spears. And then it gets real interesting. Heaps of slain. Mounds of corpses. Dead bodies without end. So much so that they can't walk around in the city without tripping over dead bodies. This is what the severe, God has had enough of their nonsense judgment, looks like. Now, this is the same God of whom the Bible says God is patient. This is the same God of whom the Bible says God is good. And how can this be? Well, because these guys are not because these guys are going around making a mess of everything they touch and bringing about destruction and corruption wherever they go, and they have to be put to an end. Their season is over, and the harvest has come. Their harvest has come. The result is that violence is returned on Assyria. See, so the judgment always fits the crime. It may be severe, but these are a severe people. They are an extremely severe people. They're not innocent. And what would happen if you just left Assyria to its own devices and God didn't judge them? They would get bigger and bigger and worse and more and more oppressive and violent and bloody and more death. This is a mercy on the world, on God's part. This is an act of God's kindness, which is why if you go back and understand that the book of Nahum is directed at Israel for Israel's comfort, you have to understand that Israel was being oppressed by these guys, and they had to be put to an end. Because if they didn't, it would only get worse. God judges what must be judged. And he does it when he decides it must happen. God has a judgment and it is severe. When God's judgment comes, it is severe. Fill in the blank number two. A sure sign of trouble, glorying in shameful things, glorying in shameful things. This is one of Assyria's major problems. This is sort of the, the second charge that gets leveled against Assyria, is that not only did they do things that were ugly and wicked and destructive and deathful, but they were happy to do it and bragged about it. Look how amazing we are. Look at how many 
people we've killed. Look how many children we've slaughtered whenever we go into a town that we're conquering. Look how destructive we can be. This is why a judgment on a place like this is good news. Because all they are interested in is glorifying and glorying in that which is evil and shameful. Now, there's a thing I think about our culture which is a little bit echoed here in Nineveh. Because our culture, our world, has lost shamefulness. There's no shame anymore. Nothing is shameful except to say, hey, that's shameful. That's where we are as a nation. And I'll tell you this right now, that's not a good thing. That is a real bad place to be, especially when you begin to look at all of the places in the Bible that acted that way. Because none of them are still around. None of them can stand up against God. And that's one of the things that we looked at, uh, I think it was last week, or maybe the week before, nobody can stand brave or arrogant before God. And that includes those who glory in shamefulness, who celebrate that which ought to be condemned. And that is our world. Our world calls that which is evil good, and that which is good evil. And if you've read the book of Isaiah, you know that's not such a good thing. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. It's another pronouncement of woe. And that's what's going on in Assyria, and I am afraid that's actually a little bit of what's going on in the culture around us, glorying in shameful things. Nahum chapter 3, verses 4 through 7. Because of the continual prostitution of the prostitute, that's Nineveh, the attractive mistress of sorcery, who treats nations and clans like merchandise by her prostitution and sorcery, I am against you. This is the declaration of the Lord of armies. I will lift up your skirts over your face and display your nakedness to nations, your shame to kingdoms. I will throw filth on you and treat you with contempt. I will make a spectacle of you. Then all who see you will recoil from you, saying, Nineveh is devastated. Who will show sympathy to her? Where can I find anyone to comfort you? This, it just keeps getting worse, doesn't it? The more you progress into this chapter, You know, that first bit about bodies laying everywhere, tripping over them, that seemed pretty bad, but now it's like, oh man, what in the world is going on in this place? So let's back up here and look at this. The continual prostitution of the prostitute. This is uh, a picture of the city of Nineveh, of the nation of Assyria. Just as last week, uh, Nineveh was pictured as a lion's den that they thought was impregnable, that they thought was all safe, that they thought nobody will go in there and put a but down the lion that lives there and its cubs. This is another picture of the, the city of Nineveh. This is, it's a faithless woman. The attractive mistress of sorcery. It's uh, enchanting the city. It, it lures and seduces nations and clans into treaties with it. It says, well, this... This will be better for you. We'll show you a better way of life than what you've got wherever you think you are. Come join with us. Make a pact with us and we'll make it all better for you. This is seduction. And it happens to you every day, by the way. Anytime you see an advertisement, that's seduction. That's what that is. You don't have this in your life. You need this in your life. Look at how amazing this will make your life. That's seducing you to buy into something. And on a grander scale, Nineveh did that to very destructive ends. Treats the nations and clans like merchandise. So what happens is they are seduced into treaties with this Uh, global superpower 
at the time, Assyria, and then when they get involved with this seductress city, the city turns on them and begins to treat them no better than your product. See, and that's actually the thing about advertising too, just so you don't know, you're the product that's being sold. Every advertisement, you're the product. They're showing you something that you, they're telling you you need. You are being sold into slavery with every one of those things you believe. And it's just obviously on a bit of a minor sort of level compared to something like this. But if you ever see something like that and you go, you know, I really, I really could use that. that. I think that would make my life a little bit better. You've been seduced. You've been seduced, every one of you. Me too. I'm not exempt. But with Nineveh, what has happened is they have commodified all of the world around them and carved it up in their minds and said, this tribe over here that's worth this much to us. That clan over there, that's worth this much. That little podunk kingdom called Israel, we can get something out of that. And when we're done, we'll crumple it up and we'll toss it away like it's nothing. So the, the city, like we mentioned earlier, is deceitful. It's totally deceitful. It is something that draws in through deception for the purposes of itself, to, to use up all that it can of what tribes, clans, nations, whatever it seduces, and then when they're done, they kill them. We've gotten what we want. We don't care if it actually works for you. Oh, they've got a great customer service line. How many of you have been frustrated by a customer service line? Yeah, right? That's because they don't actually care. They, as long as you are bought into their product, they don't they'll maybe help you a little bit to keep you along the line, string you along. But it's not faithful. It's faithless. It's prostitution. It's sorcery. It's a trick. It's a trick. It's an enchantment. It's not real. Which, by the way, sorcery in the Bible is definitely looked at very poorly. Very poorly. Watch out for that whenever you see it. I will lift up the skirts. This is the shame part. Uh, so this one and the next one. I will lift up your skirts over your face. Display your nakedness to the nations. You shame your, your shame to kingdoms. I will throw filth on you and treat you with contempt. Uh, these are actual practices. These are actual practices of conquering kingdoms. Because it was not enough for an ancient Near Eastern kingdom to come in and defeat an enemy. No, 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 no. What they want to do is defeat an enemy and then humiliate them. That's what shame is about. It's humiliation. Because if you're humiliated, if you're shamed, you're not going to put up a fight. You're not going to resist. Because shame and humiliation is an internal defeating mechanism that stops you from doing anything to change. Shame wants to put you down. Shame, humiliation, wants to grind you into the ground. That's what those practices are about. Lift up your skirts over your face, display your nakedness, throw filth on you and treat you with contempt. Because I will make a spectacle of you. It'll be a big show. Because this is what Assyria had done. Assyria had made a show out of whoever it conquered. Paraded prisoners around. Look who we defeated. Here's their king. Not very effective anymore, is he? And God says, if that's what you're going to do, that is what will be done to you. If you are going to shame you will suffer shame. Then all who see you will recoil from you. Which is the other side of the, the shame and humiliation tactic. Not only does it stop you from helping yourself, but real shame and real humiliation 
stops others from helping you. You're all alone. You're all alone when shame is on the scene. All who see you will they'll, they'll pull back, saying, Nineveh is devastated. <laughs> who will show sympathy to her? Who cares? Nobody's going to help. Why? Because they've burned all of their possible bridges of help. Everybody who could have been an ally for Assyria was attacked by Assyria. Who helps that kind of a person? Have you ever met somebody like that who just burns bridges and says, I don't need you, and I don't need you, and I don't need you, and you're a jerk, and you're an idiot, and you're ugly, and you're stupid, and I don't want you in my life, and you're a fool, and you're this, and you're that, and you're the other, and I don't think, and I'm better than you are. And eventually, that kind of a person alienates themselves to the point that they are that there's nobody to help them. There's nobody to help that kind of a person. And that's what Assyria has done to itself. And now that God has raised up Babylon to attack Assyria, shame, humiliation, they can't help themselves and there's nobody to help them. Nineveh is devastated. The fate of those who are untrustworthy is that eventually everyone turns from them. Everybody turns from that kind of a person. That's the natural consequence of living that kind of a life. Assyria reveled in traitorous seduction of other nations, which it used for its own ends, and when it needed help, nobody was interested in helping. Everybody said, nah, I'm good, thanks. What's the matter, Assyria? What's the matter, Nineveh? Not so tough anymore. Where's the lion from the lion's den? Where is the powerful creature? Where is the attractive seductress? Can't get anybody to help you anymore? There's a, there's a hint of taunt in this. This is God humiliating his enemy. And it's not the last time he does that, by the way. It's not the last time he does that. He does that with his final enemy. Death. See, when Jesus Christ goes to the cross, the cross, by the way, is the most shameful event in history because a cross was designed for humiliation. A cross was designed for shame. The fact that we wear crosses as jewelry today is astounding for this reason. Because it is a statement about that which was once the most shameful reality imaginable has now become the greatest possible symbol of hope there is. That, that which had once led to intense humiliation and shame now leads to intense eternal joy. So Jesus, what he does on the cross, is not simply defeat his enemy, but he exhausts his enemy's power and he humiliates death. Because death, you had one job, death. Keep the dead down. And it couldn't. It did not have that strength. It did not have that power. And because Jesus stood up from death and said, nope. Those who have their faith in Christ for eternal life and salvation will do the same. Death is going to touch everybody in here. Every one of us, the ticker will stop. The brain will cease to function. They'll put us in a box or an urn or something, right? That'll happen. That's not a spoiler alert, by the way. You should know this by now. <laughs> That's going to happen. But if you are in Christ, that will be reversed. And not simply reversed, but when you are resurrected in Christ on the great day of resurrection, you're going to be better than you've ever been. You're 
physicality will still be there, but it will be a transformed physicality. It will be an improvement. It will be an upgrade. It will be like nothing you've ever seen before. And Jesus has already begun the process. He may have died, but he got up again. And in the garden, the ground zero of the new creation, there is life from death. There is life from death. There is joy from shame. There is joy from shame, which brings me to my last point. We are not built to endure shame. We are never meant for shame. We were not built to endure shame. Do we do things that are shameful? Yeah, we do things that are shameful. All of us have. All of us still will. We're all going to make that choice at some point between that which is right and that which ain't. And it will be a choice between goodness and joy and shame. And yeah, we're going to choose shame at some point. But we're not built for that. We were never meant for that. Not at any point where we ever designed to be creatures who are receptacles of shame and humiliation. Hebrews 12, 2, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What does Jesus do to the cross? The ultimate instrument of shame and humiliation. It says he despises the shame. He spurns it. He brushes it off. And he says, nope, not going there. We're not doing the shame thing. He says, I'll die. But it will not be shameful. It will be glorious. It will be joyful. It will accomplish that which I have designed it to accomplish. Not what you have, Rome. Not what you have, executioner. Because what, what happens to a person on the cross? Well, they die, of course, but they're put up in public as a display of you stand against Rome, this is what you get. Bloodied, broken, naked, and on display for all to see, to know. If you stand against Rome, this is your end. Rome crucified thousands of people. Jesus, of course, was not the only person crucified, and we know that there was a thief on his right and a thief on his left, and the word thief there it's actually better translated as rebel. Better translated as an insurrectionist, somebody who fights the system. So a rebel, a rebel, and a king. Right there dying. And there were hundreds of people that day who were probably put to death on crosses. Those are the three that they just the Bible happens to tell us about. Rome loved the cross. Rome loved crosses. Rome loved putting their enemies to shame. Because it meant when people went out of their houses and looked and saw the crosses, people said, I'm not going there. If you had an inclination in your mind that you didn't want to be a part of this Rome thing, and that meant maybe a little bit of resistance, and that meant maybe a little bit of violence, You take one look at somebody on the cross and that'll give you second thoughts. That'll give you second thoughts. That'll make you go, "Ah, probably not. But Jesus went to the cross. How? Joy. He joyfully went. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross and he despised its shame sat down at the right hand of the throne of God in 1 Peter 2.6, for it stands in Scripture, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honored cornerstone. It's a reference to Jesus. 
and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. There are shameful things in this world. But we're surrounded by them. They're everywhere. There are shameful choices in this world. We're surrounded by them. They're everywhere. But we're not built for those things. And in Christ, in the cross, your shame of all of your foolish choices that you've ever made and that you ever will make are dead. That death, that shame itself has been humiliated. We will never be put to shame. We'll never be put to shame. Not in Christ. Have you made mistakes? Yeah. Me too. But he's taken care of the shame of that. He's taken it on himself and he's exhausted its strength on the cross. You don't carry that anymore. It's not yours. He took it from you. He killed it on the cross. And then he rose from death to show us that there is a better way. He saves us. He redeems us. He cleanses us of our shame. He invites us into his holy, sacred, righteous, eternal family. There's no shame in that. There's nothing to be humiliated about that. There's nothing but joy there. There's nothing but grace there. What shame did you bring this morning? It's dead. Let it go. It's gone, man. It's gone. Stop lugging it around with you. Don't listen to those voices anymore that tell you, I know what you've done, you're not worth it. Jesus says to you, I know what you've done, and I've made you worth it. There's no shame for you. We will never, never be put to shame. So that means we don't shame each other. And we don't, and when we see a shameful choice, turn from it. That's called repentance. It's just turn away. Yes, you'll make mistakes. Yes, you'll do the foolish thing. Yeah, you'll probably end up doing something shameful still. But turn your back on it. Repent of it. Turn to God. And don't, don't lug it with you anymore. Some of us carry shame around like a suitcase. This is just part of who I am. This belongs to me. This is mine. No, it ain't. It's useless luggage. Customs in heaven won't allow it through. Might as well drop it now. Just drop it. Don't take it with you. It doesn't belong. Don't be a Nineveh. Don't be in Nineveh. Don't be in Assyria. Don't live in shameful things. Don't glory in shameful things. Drop those shameful things. Run to the cross. Run to the cross of Christ. Here's some questions for reflection and then an action step. Where do you see our culture glorying in shameful things? Where do you see it? And don't give me the Sunday school answer. Everywhere. It's the world. Yeah. How? Think this through. Observe. Analyze. Detect. Pull apart. Learn to think. See what is shameful and avoid it. Number two, where do you feel shame? And why Still carry it if Jesus wants you to drop it. Why still carry it if Jesus says, drop it? Here's an action step. 
I will deposit my shame at the foot of the cross and walk away from it, carrying Christ's forgiveness instead. If you've got to carry something, carry that. It's a much lighter load. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for eradicating our shame. Thank you for putting to death our humiliation. Thank you for offering us a welcome into your eternal kingdom and family. I pray, Father, that as we continue on our way, carry out our week, that we learn to see shameful things and to turn from them and turn instead to your joy and your peace and your righteousness, which is always so much better. Help us to not glory in shameful things, but to revel in the joy of our salvation and to carry that burden, for it is much lighter than our shame. We pray all of this in your name. Amen.